My name is Megan Rafferty, and on behalf of Canadian Women in Sport, thank you for joining us. I'm always glad when people can come together uh, from sport and physical activity and recreation to talk about uh, how to make programs and activities better for girls. And I'm even more excited when it's my own province this time. So welcome. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some experiences and the latest research with you and uh, some practices for retaining girls in sport by applying a gender lens. So today we're on Zoom and we will be using a number of its key functions. At this time, you can stay muted unless you are speaking. There will be many opportunities for you to contribute and discuss ideas, but we'll ask that you stay muted in the meantime, to, and then everybody can hear really well. Um, like I said, it's an interactive session, so please do turn on your camera. It's not mandatory, uh, but if you're comfortable, we'd invite you to. And if you do have any questions related to the content or some of the technical aspects we're going to use, um, just pop those in the chat feature and uh, either myself or Vanessa will address those as soon as we can. And we'll be using annotation and breakout rooms today in Zoom and uh, we'll go over those in further detail when it comes time. We will get started. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Vanessa. I'm an employee of Canadian Women in Sport. I'm really, similarly to Megan, I'm really glad to be here today and have the opportunity to um, present to you this, this workshop. Um, I, I was really lucky I got to be involved in the development process. Um, so as you know, the Government of Canada you know, committed to gender equity um, and all levels of sport by 2035. Um, this workshop is part of a greater project that CPRA has taken on um, to increase the retention and participation of girls in recreational sport in Canada. And they are looking at this from a number of lenses that you see at the bottom of this slide here. So age um, and stage of life are the main considerations. Uh, so this workshop is part of a series that's now been moved to virtual. Uh, the idea initially was that we were going to be able to you know, meet everybody province to province, territory to territory, but um, hopefully they'll be able to take place again once uh, things are a little bit safer. Um, towards the end of the workshop, you're going to be able to find out about some granting opportunities, both with CPRA and Canadian Women in Sport. Um, so this workshop is going to touch on a number of the goals that you'll find in the framework for recreation. Uh, this is a document that was released in 2015 with the idea of increasing the meaningfulness and capacity of engagement in rec sport on an individual to community level. Um, so we're going to be, you know, touching on fostering active living through physical recreation, um, which meets, you know, goal number one, increasing inclusion and access to retention for the population that faces constraint to participation, <clears throat> number two and uh, ensuring the provision of supportive physical and social environment that encourage participation in recreation and build strong and caring communities from uh, value or goal four. Lastly, we want to ensure the continued growth and sustainability of the recreational field, which meets goal number five. So we're going to be touching on all four of those uh, throughout this workshop. And uh, hopefully you're going to take away a lot of really valuable information from this experience. So I will pass the mic back over to Megan, um, who's going to speak a little bit more about Canadian Women in Sport, as well as uh, take you through some really fun activities to start. Thanks, Vanessa. So Canadian Women in Sport is a national organization that's been around for almost 40 years. Their name has changed. You might have known us as 
Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport. Uh, and that change just happened in February 2020. So despite the name change, our mandate has stayed the same. Women in Sport is committed to advancing gender equity in the Canadian sports sector at the systems level through partnerships with nas national organizations such as CPRA, governments and sector leaders. I'll play a video now that does a great job of explaining why Canadian Women in Sport does what it does. On the field, in the pool, at the arena, wherever sport lives, the challenge is there to push the limits, to overcome obstacles, to be better than we were yesterday. That's the power of sport. But for girls, there are additional forces preventing them from playing. Our challenge is to keep girls in the game because girls who stay in sports become women who rise to a challenge, achieve their potential and make the world a better place. Because when inclusion is not just a buzzword, we all benefit. At Canadian Women and Sports, we're leading the charge. We partner with organizations who share our goal because we know we are stronger when we work together. It's time to reimagine our approach to sport. Together, we will change the game and we will keep girls playing until they become leaders in sport and beyond. Leaders who were once themselves those young girls. On the field, in the pool, and at the arena. I love watching that video and it gets me all excited every single time. <laughs> Um, so you can find that video and other information and resources on the Canadian Women and Sport website. Um, it is so full of quality research and reports. If you haven't already, I really encourage you uh, to go take a look, womenandsport.ca. Uh, they're also active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at womenandsportca. So we're going to hop to our agenda. We'll have a welcome and then we'll get into some definitions and some material through a mix of case studies and lots of engagement with the audience and some peer collaborations. We'll do some icebreakers to get us started and I am going to do an activity before we get into that, as well as a land acknowledgement. So I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. These heartlands are the heartland of the Métis people, and we acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. We understand that Indigenous women and girls have been underserved in our industry and throughout this workshop we will continue to commit to doing a better job and working alongside our partners to improve their lives through recreation, physical activity and sport. Now before we get to know one another um, in light of, I know all of us spending a lot of time in front of screens and, um, you know, uh, perhaps a little bit distracted and busy in these pandemic times, we're going to all turn off our videos for a moment and just share a minute doing a mindfulness practice. So I'd invite you to turn off your video and I will too. And we'll just ground ourselves a little bit to prepare for the presentation. 
So you can gently close your eyes or have them half closed if that's more comfortable. Take a deep breath and let your shoulders relax down your back. Rest your feet flat on the floor. Take one more deep belly breath. We're going to start our grounding exercise with our feet. You can shift your mind to focus on the connection of your feet to the floor. Let them sink a little deeper and become a little heavier. We'll move up to our sit bones and your lower back. Feel the weight of them against your chair. Take another deep breath and let your back and shoulders sink down, allowing for more space between your ears and shoulders. We're gonna take three more deep breaths, listening for the silence between my words, and just let go of the thoughts and busyness of your day. After your third deep breath, I'll invite you to Gently, slowly open your eyes and turn your video back on. Thank you for joining me with that moment of mindfulness. I hope you're a little more relaxed and focused to take in the rest of the presentation. All right. So our first icebreaker is going to be getting to know one another. I know that um, I think we have people from all over Manitoba, which is awesome. So we're gonna rename ourselves and practice using that feature in Zoom. Um, you're going to include your preferred pronouns and the community or city that you are from. So your name, your preferred pronouns and your city. I'll give everybody a quick moment to do that. Awesome, I'm seeing a few of them come in. If you're on a laptop, you can right click on your little video screen um, or in the participant under the participant tab, um, you'll see a drop down menu and the fourth option is rename. As you're working on that, we can pop into our first poll. It is anonymous, but I'd like you to um, Think about who inspired you to be physically active or play sports growing up. Was it a family member, a professional athlete, or an educator perhaps, or this one might not be applicable for you? So far, family member is really in the lead. And we have just about, yep, yeah, there we go, all the votes. Okay, so I have presented uh, this presentation before and it has pretty consistently been that the majority was inspired by uh, a family member, which is really um, a great check-in for us, I think. You know, we probably are surrounded by 
close friends and family. And I don't think we always think about the um, chance we have to inspire those around us. So that's very cool. We're gonna jump right into another anonymous poll. Um, and you're gonna reflect on what motivates you to work in the uh, recreation and physical activity sector. So is it the community you serve, your team around you? Is it more about the positive impact sport and physical activity has had in your life? Okay, we have almost everyone's vote. I'll leave it up for three more seconds. Awesome. So by a landslide again, uh, the positive impact that sport and physical activity had in our own lives. A close second is the community I serve, which um, is so great to hear. And it you know, reminds me that Manitoba is uh, lucky to have so many of you in the rules that you're in across our province. Awesome, thanks, Vanessa. So we're going to try out another feature of Zoom now. And Vanessa is going to pop everybody into a breakout room and you're going to have an opportunity to introduce yourself and share what you hope to get out of the session today. So we'll just start a little bit of focused uh, thoughts on what you're looking for um, and share that with your group in order to allow for a little bit of networking. We always wanna make sure that that plays a role in these presentations. So you'll have about four minutes and uh, we'll give you a little warning. If you've never been in a breakout room, we'll give you a little warning that uh, your time is almost up and then you can come on back. Thanks, Vanessa. So Erin, I didn't put you in a breakout room. I wasn't sure if you wanted to be in one. Um, no, no, that's great. I'm quite happy to just hang out here. Erin, Megan, Megan, Erin. Nice to, <laughs> to meet you too. So regarding that message with the, the error from Eventbrite, yeah. um, there's not really anything I can do on that end, on our end, just because I've, I, I read what it said and it had to do with the email they use to register yeah so for future workshops I think we'll just have to um I think in the confirmation email we just send them the direct link to zoom I know even in the email that you sent the staff it was another registration link for zoom yeah and so it was that's just the sort of preventative measure so that we have a link that people we at least have their email and name if they come in and they're not someone who we yeah. have on registration. Um, but that's it. It just asks for name and email and then they get the direct yeah. link. But there's no login after that. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll just test out a few different ways maybe for next time just so that mm -hmm. everybody who wants to be in is in. Um, mm -hmm. Great work, Megan. Thank you for doing the intros and, and setting the stage. It's going to be a good session. Awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you're happy. I don't, I don't know if Vanessa told you, so I'm at CPRA. Cool. Um, we're the partner on this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, um, I didn't know, obviously, the um, face, the name, but uh, yeah. I knew that you guys were the partner. And um, yeah, that's great. So you're right in Ottawa. 
I'm in Ottawa. Yeah, we just moved from Toronto to Ottawa in the middle of the summer. Oh, wow. Was new, but somehow we're at the end of October and it's now months and months away. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, MJ Akande just, just joined us. She's um, one of our partners from Recreations Manitoba or Rec Connections Manitoba. Okay. Her and name she- is very familiar to me. Yeah, you've probably seen lots. She's the head of communications there at Rec Connection. So you've probably okay. seen a lot come in and out from her. Yeah. Um, so she's on. I think she must be in a breakout right now. Yes. Um, but yeah, so the two of us are on. I'm going to okay. silently work away in the background here. But if there's anything, but ask us, I can your email or whatever. Great. You probably um here my partner he's on a call here in the background so we're trying to coordinate zoom calls in a tight living space i'm keeping my fingers crossed that nobody like walks down the sidewalk and that my dog has to announce you know yeah yeah mine is currently asleep beside me but he was on our call earlier with vanessa and terry like (laughs) toys up on the couch i'm like get out of here yeah um the last presentation I did with CWS uh, to my partner because it was in the evening and he's a teacher so he would normally be gone during the day and so like now it's totally fine but I'm like so no internet no streaming no whatever you need to like do all that before or after but I need the whole internet to myself (laughs) yeah exactly it's a bit of a dance right now everybody working from home yeah um, do you want to give them a one-minute warning, Vanessa? So the, it just went off right now. Okay. So I had set I had set a four-minute timer within the group, so people can come back anywhere between now and the next sixty seconds. Okay, perfect. Oh, and some people are already back. Hello. Great. Hi. Hi. Who is that? This is Finn, and he's supposed to be having a nap. So if I go off the screen, it's because maybe I've tired him out with enough pencils off the table. He just throws them off. Okay. Hi, Finn. How are you? Not sleepy. <laughs> Hi. He doesn't care. He's, I put like eight pencils nah. beside us, and he's just lobbing them onto the floor incredible while you guys were in your breakout rooms we were just chatting about the uh joys of you know all working from home and balancing things like you know parenting and presentations and work commitments so we'll just wait a few more minutes for others to come back it's great that everybody is enjoying their time getting to know each other better Everybody's back now. Okay, thanks, Vanessa. So hopefully that was beneficial for you and you got to know somebody that perhaps you didn't know before you came on today. Uh, Let's dive into the workshop objectives. So retaining girls in sport, uh, this is going to be a 90 minute workshop. We're gonna go over some foundational concepts. And then my favorite part is always applying those in a practical sense so that coaches and sport leaders and recreation leaders are very well equipped to design programs that will enhance girls' engagement and extend their participation in recreation. So you're going to leave uh, with an understanding of the unique barriers that girls face and an arsenal of tools to meet those physical, developmental, and social needs to girls in your programming. We will set the context by defining some uh, key terms that we're gonna use throughout the workshop. And we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page with those definitions so that we can use them uh, throughout. So equity and equality are fairly common terms, but they're often mistaken to be interchangeable. They are very similar, but it's important to understand the small difference. As an organization with the mission of advancing gender equity, Canadian Women in Sport is often clarifying the difference between these two terms. Uh, To give you a sport metaphor, equality focuses on creating the same starting line for everyone. So it gets everybody to that same point so that they 
um, can start together, where equity focuses on providing everyone with the full range of opportunities and benefits so that they can achieve a similar outcome or more importantly, reach the same finish line. This difference equity acknowledges and encourages us to address the many contributing factors that impact our starting line. And the best way I can highlight uh, the, these two definitions is an example. I worked alongside um, a rec director who wanted to provide uh, track time for a group of kids who live in the inner city Winnipeg um, who didn't have access to a track. And uh, so we set up some uh, track time we got rented and we got the uh, university track team to coach and we thought we were in business ready to go. So our first week we picked up the kids after school, we had arranged the busing and we bust them over to the track and the this group of kids arrives and uh, sure enough they are in it it was like November um, they're in winter boots and jeans and so in that moment we thought we were doing the right thing but it turned out that that was equality we wanted those kids to have track time and track coaches and we gave them that just like everybody else got track time and track coaches. But what they really needed was equity. They needed running shoes, they needed shorts and t-shirts to be in the gym. It wasn't enough to just bust them and rent the track. So that was the difference that we quickly rectified on week two. And um, that is, is a great way to highlight this difference between equality and equity. I want to clarify also that gender equity is the process of allocating resources, programs, and decision making fairly so that men and women uh, can, and any imbalances in the benefits available, uh, so that people of, di or including people of diverse genders. All right, moving on to di uh, intersectionality. So this is a relatively new term that people are less familiar with. We've chosen to include a complete definition and uh, we do really wanna focus on this. So intersectionality considers the layers of an individual's identity and how that impacts how they move through the world. In the next section, you're gonna see how the factors of someone's identity correlate to their likelihood of joining sport and then staying in sport. Intersectionality is a necessary lens from that we have to consider in program planning at all levels, right from organization leads, sport administrators and program deliverers. Another key term we want to go over, which I'm sure you have heard of, um, is long-term development. And we're actually going to try the annotation feature on this slide. So if you pop up into the top of your screen and you'll see a drop down box and it, the annotation feature is there on the left and you can choose your stamp and i would like you to give a little check mark if you have heard of this before or a star if you would like to know more or if it is totally new to you uh, just pop a little question mark stamp on there And you can do that as I'm describing it. So long-term development in sport and physical activity 3.0 is a very valuable resource that considers the Canadian sport experience across the lifespan from when they're born all the way until they exit. Um, as you can see, it's multi-stage training. It includes competition recreation, and this um, document touches on some of the barriers to girls and women, as well as some strategies to go to get into gender neutrality and considerations based on social differences. 
So I'm seeing some question marks and some check marks. So that's great. So in the chat a couple of minutes ago, I uploaded a file that has a number of definitions for other key terms, really brief ones, um, but they're quite relevant to program design uh, when it comes to sport recreation and, and gender equity. So those would include unconscious bias, um, diversity and inclusion, and then what Megan already spoke to, which is long-term development, intersectionality, and um, the difference between equity and equality. So feel free to download and reference that. If you're having any troubles accessing it, shoot me a message. Thanks. Thanks, Vanessa. We're gonna use that annotation feature again and answer this multiple choice question. So if you can annotate, I'd like you to mark your best guess to what percentage of Canadian girls are not participating in any kind of sport, recreation or physical activity. I'll give you a few seconds to put in your best guess. Lots of guesses for 62. All right. Well, the correct answer is unfortunately 51%. So we're just over half of Canadian girls that aren't participating in valuable programs that you guys are leading in recreation across Manitoba. So. We're going to get into these intersecting factors. So earlier this year, Canadian Women and Sport released the Rally Report. It's an annual review of Canadian sport, recreation and physical activity landscape. While a major focus is girls participation, it also covers women's representation in coaching and leadership positions. So you'll see that 62% of Canadian girls are not participating in some sport of sport recreation or physical activity. There are other factors that either increase or decrease an individual's likelihood to participating in sport. An example, as many of us know, one in three girls in the 13 to 15 age range drop out of sport. However, if that girl has a disability, or her family earns less than $50,000, those odds of dropping out are even greater. So this table shows us why we have to consider more than just program execution when looking at engaging girls in sport and recreation. While not all these factors are within our influence as leaders, what barriers can we take a look at to lessen or eliminate? We're going to do another question. So using the annotation again, can you answer what percentage of girls report that quality of programming was a barrier to their participation? You have 15%, 28%, 33% or 43%. You're, uh, you're all getting a hang of the annotate. That's really great. Yeah. Okay, just a few more seconds. Thank you everyone for participating. The correct answer is 43%. So as you can see, nearly half of girls surveyed said that the program quality was a barrier to their participation and continuation in sport. On this slide, you can see that the various reasons for the quality of a program can be diminished. And these are really reasons that are, are 
fully within our control. Um, you know, we see these pictures of drop uh, that are picturing girls at a drop in night at a, a community center, and um, the girls are wearing the boys' hand me down equipment. Um, or the girls are getting, they're invited to come either late at night, early in the morning, and we can look really critically at these things and make some changes because they are within our control. We're going to continue our discussion on factors that impact girls' participation in sport recreation and physical activity. But before we jump into those factors, let's go over everything that's been missed when a girl drops out of sport prematurely. And these are things that I work with in some of my girl specific programming that I do in the community. And it's so important and I'm so glad to be sharing uh, them with you today. So we know that girls who participate in recreation, sport and physical activity have improved physical health, higher self-esteem, uh, increased social competence, greater academic performance, stronger leadership abilities, more professional opportunities, and better visibility for the next generation of girls in sport. And I would even go so far as to say that many of you are in the roles that you're in today because you got to have all of the many of these benefits from your participation. So as we know, girls experience these barriers at a number of junctures. These junctures are broken into four layers in this model. It's called a socio-ecological model. So it goes through the interpersonal, intrapersonal, environmental, and policy and societal. So there's a lot of content here to look at, but I'm just gonna overview each, each realm uh, quickly. So the intrapersonal is what a girl may think or feel that prevents her from participating in the activities that you guys provide. This can result from stereotypes believing, for example, that that activity is too rough for girls or she'll be perceived as having a specific sexual preference um, if she likes that physical activity or she doesn't want to be seen as disruptive by pointing out a barrier to her participation in sport. Then we'll move to the interpersonal. Um, so that looks at close relationships that influence a girl's understanding of the role of sport. Does she have the emotional or economic support of her family to participate? And you guys probably see that a lot in the communities that you serve to see, you know, who's coming out regularly and who's participating in these rec opportunities um, because of what their family is able to, to support. Then there's their environment sphere. Um, it considers the different access points to sport literally and figuratively. So are there programs available? Are they high quality? Are there other girls in the program? Are there other appropriate cultural measures in place? For example, for a Muslim girl to participate. Is the right equipment? Are there female role models present in the coaching and program administrators? Uh, a great example I have for this one uh, that I've seen is uh, in Manitoba, we have a newcomer sport academy. So it's a recreational sport group that introduces new Canadian kids to a variety of sports in the calendar year. And so they do probably about eight or 10 and it's a fantastic program. And uh, similarly to my other example, you know, there's so many logistical things about getting kids um, ready to go to that community center or participate in that uh, activity. Um, and one of them was swimming. And I know that the leader had a lot to learn that first time about making sure that the girls had appropriate burkinis to wear uh, for, and, and that had to be appropriate with their cultural uh, beliefs. And, and they also had to be at a separate time at the swimming pool um, than the males 
who were also participating. So there's so many levels for us to think about. And I know you all have so much on your plates and it's, it's a million things to keep in your mind, but we just wanna highlight the importance of all these different factors. I just wanna to touch lastly then on the policy related sphere. So that's the external structures that affect a community's access to quality programming. So is the program adequately funded? Is it held at a time that girls can attend? Um, and are there an appropriate realm of streams for girls? So is there a recreational level there as well as a competitive? With these different spheres in mind, we can imagine that while one girl may have the support of her family, um, another one may not. And that's a difference that we can look at and keep in the back of our mind. As advocates for girls' participation in sport and recreation physical activity, we need to ask ourselves, what barriers exist to the programs that you offer? And what barriers can you mitigate? Keep intersectionality in mind and this model, because you can remember that not everyone's experience is the same. I know that's a lot of content. So while that's sinking in, we're going to move to a breakout annotation activity. So I'm going to pass it to Vanessa to launch the breakout rooms and Jamboard for this one. We're going to brainstorm some factors that you believe limit or enhance a girl's experience in recreation and what we can do to enhance that experience. Great, so I've just added a link to the chat for a Jamboard. Um, I'll pull it up for you right now. Is what I was trying to do a moment ago. <laughs> but not at the right time. <laughs> so I'll share my screen once again. So for anyone who hasn't used Jamboard before, it's part of the Google Suite. So, um, so long as you click the link in the chat, this is what you should be able to see. And you're going to be put back in your breakout rooms in a moment, and each breakout room is numbered. Um, and then you'll go using the slides at the top, you'll go to your slide. So if I was in breakout room two, I would click once to the right. And then with your group, you can discuss the barriers and enhancers that you believe impact uh, girls' participation in sport and recreation. When you decide you want to put something down on the slide, use the menu bar on the left and you'll click the fourth one, which is, you'll see here, it says sticky note. So I'll click it here. I can choose whatever color I want my sticky note to be, I'd like it to be orange. Um, and then I would put my response right here, save, close out, and then I can move it around. If it's a barrier, I'll leave it on the left. If it's an enhancer, I will pop it on the right. And then Megan, we will have, um, everybody share a couple of responses towards the end, maybe someone from each group or one group? Yes, so if everybody can uh, pick a team captain and when you come back, I will pick, I think we'll have time for two groups to report back on the barriers that you identified as well as what you thought you could do to enhance that. So everybody be ready to share and we'll pick a couple lucky winners. Great, so I'll just relaunch the breakout rooms now. So there are here, let me. All right, so a couple of you have been plopped into breakout room five um, and then we still have our, yeah, perfect. So they're opening now. Megan, how many minutes did you say? Six? Yes, we'll give you six minutes and a little warning as well. Great. All right, enjoy.
I'm feeling a lot more relaxed with less content. Yes. <laughs> Not as pressed for time. Yes. And after delivering it yesterday, it just gives me a little bit more confidence um, on where to kind of paraphrase and and then you know the stuff like intersectionality and socio ecological stuff that you they wanted to highlight more but yeah Any other, other than what you sent me in the chat box, any other feedback you want? No? Okay. Thanks. It's so nice to present the same material again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, I'm looking at all of the Jamboard slides and there's stickies in each one. Um, did you want to pop into a breakout room and just see how they're doing? Yes, and I really liked yesterday how you prompted Megan on uh, who's looked really full. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So sure, I can. So I'll put you, I'll put you in breakout room three because they're there. <laughs> okay. Hey, can you, you back there? I didn't click on the Jamboree before and it doesn't let oh. me access the link once you're in there. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Um, oh, are you not able to get back now? Can you send me back? I actually had to leave to get back here to get the link, I think. Okay. But. I'll move you to breakout room five. There's only two people there. I just okay. can't send you to the same one for whatever reason. 
Oh, okay. Did you get the prompt? No. Mm. They're closing in a minute. Okay. So. Yeah, I just, because you put the link in the, the main chat, once you go to your breakout room, you can only talk to those other, like in your own group. Right, right. Well, group one is good. Group two is a couple on either side. Group five is also done really well. They're starting to come back now, so thank you. Everybody's slowly starting to come back from their groups. We saw lots of stickies, so I'm glad to see that was a helpful exercise. Looking forward to hearing from a few captains. All right, it looks like we're all back now. Yes, great. Okay, can I have the captain of group five? I would love to hear what you put in the barriers and the ideas to enhance. Hi, uh, my name is MJ. Um, so under the barriers we put religious beliefs um money facilities um we put money because um, a lot of people don't have the funds to be able to actually attend those um events even if you put them on it could be too far from their house it could be they couldn't afford the specialized equipment required for those activities um some people just want to have fun so having sports that are too competitive sometimes puts um girls off those sports friends and family if they don't have friends and family that either play sports or live an active lifestyle it could deter them or they have family that believes more in other things for example academics or other forms of um, activity and then scheduling so um, balancing academics with the social life could also play a role in limiting girls barrier to sports uh, for enhancers we put having group sessions as opposed to individual um, sessions could encourage more people to live an active lifestyle they don't stand out and they also can um, learn from the collective group having a close family member who is active can also provide that sort of like leadership or role model <laughs> type situation for them they can look onto someone and can also reach out to someone that may have similar beliefs or lifestyles to them that they can ask questions um, having tasted sessions um, because we felt that um, even if the activities were free, some people may not actively participate because they don't know what it's like. So just being able to go test it for 10 minutes as opposed to committing to that sport or that activity and then having close friends that are willing to do it with them will help to get more girls and women active. Awesome. Thank you, MJ. That was a, a great job. I, you touched on a number of points that we're going to get into a little bit more, especially about that social piece for girls, um, having the friend and what that does with her social connections. Um, so that was great. I'm also going to ask the captain of group one to share. Sorry, before we get into that, I would love to just clarify um, with one of the barriers that was mentioned being uh, cultural or religious beliefs. Um, that when you're discussing that, it, it needs to be a little bit more nuanced in the fact that it's, you know, it's not the religion itself, but how it's not necessarily being accommodated and how that can that can hold people back or like a lack of um, cultural or religious humility among program leaders and um, the the awareness piece, um, just because on its own it it, it sends um, a more negative uh, message or um, not an uninclusive 
an exclusive message. So just a lack of awareness among program leaders of religious beliefs. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> I should have explained better. No, it's all good. We've, we've done this before and it's, it's totally valid. You just have to like make sure that nobody leaves this thinking, thinking one thing and, and not the other. Mm -hmm. Justine, are you the team one captain? Yes, I am. Are you gonna, Vanessa, put that? Yes, she will. Just give her one moment to pop over to that screen. So for group one, our barriers, we kind of focused on some of the stuff that uh, was talked about in the previous survey and, and reasons why individuals didn't participate or girls specifically didn't participate. Um, so the negative body image or the too much focus on or, or not enough focus on girls like in sport. Um, it's not, again, not geared towards girls. So focusing more on the male participants. Um, there is another, we, we had a big discussion about um, kind of a work-life balance, but also um, for women in particular, the life part is there's more um, uh, components. So there's a lot more demand um, on a lot of women in the household uh, that would be a barrier towards participation in any type of physical activity. Um, and that could relate to time, also finances. Um, they don't they're spending their money on other things. So they're not spending them, their money on themselves. Uh, and then another big one is childcare. So making sure, especially in single parent households, um, ensuring the availability of childcare during the time of participation um, is definitely a huge barrier. We don't, there's not a whole bunch of daycares or any childcare available in the evenings or on weekends. Um, so that's definitely a big thing. And then we, when we were talking about enhancers, um, kind of the female focused programming, so really kind of marketing and programming towards what females in your community are looking at or are interested in. Um, so definitely needs assessments are huge there, just looking at your community and making sure that you know, what they would like to participate in. Um, the supportive family is a huge thing. Uh, if it isn't a single parent household, making sure that husbands or partners or whatever are uh, supportive of those recreational opportunities. Definitely subsidies are huge enhancers, taking away that financial burden um, or limiting it for sure. The positive role models, I think kind of, we see a whole bunch of bloggers and, and things like that online now where they're kind of the super mom, right? Or the, the super female. So the positive role model, we can get it all done, but I think we also need to identify that not everyone's like that. And we need to put in those supports to help people achieve that kind of level of super. Um, and I think that was, Oh, and then just the facilities and community spaces. So making those conducive of, I really think that, and I think our group would agree, the, the family setting. Um, the discussion was brought up about uh, the, the hockey rinks that have a walking track around them, things like that, that encourage participation with parents as well as their children. So yeah, that's our group. Yeah, great job, Justine and, and group one. I, um, I just had a phone call. We have a, a yoga class in our community. And I, I probably within the last two weeks, I had this phone call with this mom who was trying to figure out how to get into the class and balancing uh, childcare and, you know, having to pre-register in these COVID times. And at one point she was so discouraged. She's like, you know what? I actually just think that a physical activity is just not for me and I can't participate in these rec. And I was like, no, 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 wait, we're going to figure something out. But there are a lot of, uh, a lot of dynamics there to consider. And you guys did a great job of hitting on those. All right, we will move along to the reasons girls leave sport and recreation. 
Uh, those were some great jam boards. You guys came up with a lot of barriers and enhancers. And again, like I said before, having to consider all of those, it can be overwhelming. And I know there's al always so many things in the back of uh, your minds as rec and physical activity leaders. There's so much to think about. Um, but we are going to address the top four that lead girls in Canada to leave sport so that maybe it doesn't feel quite so overwhelming to address all those pieces at once. So like you mentioned, uh, I think group one, um, the time commitment, uh, competing time commitment, school, part-time work, you said the family piece, uh, there's the financial barriers and you know, it's so important to always think about not just um, the registration, initial upfront fee, but then the fees of whatever equipment they need to bring that day, the fee of getting the bus ride there. You know, there's so many pieces in the financial that, that don't really stop once you pay the, the first, you know, drop-in rate or registration rate or whatever that is. Uh, there is injuries to think about and keep in mind to make sure you're providing a safe sport environment and girls losing enjoyment. So we are going to talk about how you guys as program leaders and rec administrators um, can address these barriers and have a positive impact on the girls in your communities. So we're going to look at these four, the first one being consult. We are today surrounded with 22 people who all have an area of expertise uh, that they can share with whoever um, may need that area enhanced in their programming. So you can take a look at your programs, see when girls are leaving, why girls are leaving, and then reach out and, and find somebody who is an expert in that area and have them uh, be an engaged stakeholder. You want to build supportive environments. Um, that happens through positive coaching and prioritizing social connections. I, I think we touched on it earlier and I said we're going to get into it more, but girls always report girls and women always report coming back to that rec opportunity or drop in or uh, physical activity because of the supportive relationships that they have there and that element of connection. I see it in all the realms of the work that I do from sport to yoga in the community and and it's always about who they feel connected to when they're there. We want to be fostering fun with every interaction and activity. It's really important for girls and women that fun is a primary goal. And lastly, injury prevention. Uh, we're going to quickly touch on a few of the common injuries that sideline girls and, and equip your program deliverers to prevent them. As I said, in consulting, you have those external stakeholders, but you also have your staff, community, participants, and other organizations. I worked for some time in the disability community and they had such a great um, focus on asking, and, and they taught me about the importance of asking the person with disability what we needed to do for them. We sit there and try to design all of these things, but we forget to ask the individual. And I think that asking your program participants that are girls and women, it, it will give you the best answer as you're going straight to the source. Um, and then, you know, when we know better, we do better. That's Maya Angelou's quote. And, and when we have, when we're equipped with that information, we can do a better job. I'll also chime in to say that we um, at Canadian Women's Sport had a project that ran three years long and it was about um, offering opportunities to participate in sport and physical activity for newcomer women and girls. And the number of sport organizations who had a tremendous amount of success by partnering with settlement agencies who were already connected to that community group and knew their needs. It, 
it was incredible. They were bypassing so many barriers that other sport orgs were experiencing, like recruitment, um, what Megan mentioned about having, you know, the correct staffing, understanding, you know, cultural humility, all of those pieces. So, you know, it's, it's, there are people who are already out there doing the work and having the information and it's about expanding your network and, and learning through others' experiences it can go a really long way. So moving on to that safe environment, uh, when we are considering girls' key motivations to participation, creating the social, a social and emotionally safe space for your participants must be a priority. A safe environment is not just the physical space and emergency procedures and COVID protocols right now. Uh, these three factors with the physical environment, the social environment, and then the physical and mental health are all interrelated. They all play their part. And without considering one of them, you can't achieve that holistic supportive program environment. So we're going to get into a little bit more about what that looks like by uh, taking a look at what motivates girls to start that play and then also stay. So understanding your participants' motivations to be in the program is key to getting them to want to join. But then the other piece of that, as I'm sure you all know, is the retention in your program. You can see there's key distinction between what leads to positive outcomes for girls versus boys. For many boy participants, performance enhances their social position. For girl participants, social acceptance enhances their individual and group performance. So girls need to know that they're accepted and valued for who they are. And when they feel accepted, she that that girl has the security to try without fear of social repercussions um, she has the confidence to make mistakes or fail and then put in the effort that leads to improved performance and fuels even more effort and all of this it has social connections at the root of it uh, managing group dynamics for all of these pieces is so important. I'll just give one uh, real life example here. There's a, a program, a community program for girls who are wanting to uh, train in a female only environment for a uh, long distance track. And uh, what we know about boys is that racing against each other really fuels them and uh, racing to beat the other people on their team is a key motivator but girls we know that that isn't the case so that program set up um, girls running to be a race against their their time from last week and uh, or a time from when they last did that distance and they didn't all start at the same time so there was no defined person who came in first and who came in second and who ran further and taking that aspect out of it really contributed to a team dynamic where we weren't against each other we were actually all rooting for each other and it was great very supportive environment for girls to participate in recreational running at that point So in building the supportive environments, it goes beyond just the basics of the program. We can define an environment, a, a supportive environment as being welcoming, uh, emphasizing the value of safe sport and recreation, uh, prioritizing social connections, like we said before, that exposure to role models and leading to the empowerment of girls in and outside of the sport. It's important to acknowledge that in the same way a girl's sport and physical activity experience can be greatly influenced at the different socio-ecological levels of her life. Everyone has a role to play from organization leads right down to program deliverers. I want you to reflect on your staff culture and consider where you guys are meeting the mark in that supportive environment, or maybe where you can shift some of your focus and resources. 
I, I want to go into a little bit more of that role model. Um, we have briefly touched on it a couple of times. I'm going to go back to that newcomer uh, physical activity group that I spoke about before. And they, like I said, they do a great job of introducing uh, different activities, you know, in a Canadian setting to these newcomer uh, kids. And, but what they do that is so impressive to me is that they start mentoring their teenagers and older participants to becoming leaders uh, for the group. So these young girls who are starting to participate can actually look and see somebody who's 16 and 17 who is participating and leading them and then they can truly see themselves in that position and then staying in that sport for their teenage years uh, or, or that activity for their teenage years so it's so like I, I just love to see that happening and I, I see the retention of girls uh, as a result of that. So supportive environments can't exist without those visible role models I talked about. We need champions of gender equity. And then we can reap the full benefits of role models when they consciously practice those really healthy habits and positive attitudes that the program participants can learn from. Representation is necessary. So all girls have a role model they can look up to. We're going to do an annotation activity to take a look at how to include and leverage role models in creating a safe and empowering environment. So you can put a stamp next to the suggestion on this slide um, that you think is the most impactful or that you're the most excited to try. So pop your annotations on again, pick whatever stamp you would like and uh, let us know which one is the most impactful for you or that you're the most excited to try. I particularly like the one, the first one for recognizing the role models that they have in their life because it's, you're kind of putting it on the participants to say like, okay, well, who is a positive role model? And then they have to also identify what those like positive actions are. Um, that one I've always had a lot of really fruitful conversations and discussions with teams and, and groups. I love that there is a stamp beside just all four of them, which means that recreation in Manitoba is in great shape to try out all four of these. So that's awesome. There are a bunch of other suggestions like these that you can find in that resource we mentioned before, and we'll, we'll link to it again after the workshop. It's called She Belongs, and it's on building a social connection for lasting participation in sport. Okay, we're going to go back to our breakout rooms. And you're going to have the opportunity to discuss this scenario. Uh, it doesn't, the slide doesn't carry over to your breakout room. So I'm going to read it in full. So you're the program deliverer. And towards the end of your program, you notice the attendance of girls in your co-ed uh, sport recreation program drastically decreased. When you asked one of the participants, why fewer girls were attending. She explained that boys don't pass and a number of the girls were bullying each other at school. The majority of the girls register again for the upcoming program cycle. How do you, ex how do you plan for the next program cycle knowing this? So in your breakout rooms, you're gonna have six minutes to discuss what the underlying issues are who you would consult. Remember we went, we talked about that. Consult, consult, consult. Who are your stakeholders and your experts you could talk to? And then lastly, how you would track if this change has made a positive impact in the experience of the participants. So we want to look at the issues, get some expert advice, and then how you track those, the progress and changes. 
So we'll give you six minutes. You'll go back into your same groups. We'll give you a little warning and I'm gonna pick two different groups this time to report back. So have your team captain uh, jot down some of your discussion. Oh, Vanessa is kindly putting the questions in the chat box. Yep, the questions are in the chat box and the rooms are getting opened now. How are we doing on timing, Vanessa? Uh, yeah, we're a bit tight. So I'm taking out, we only have two more. Um, we have fostering fun and injury prevention. So I'm gonna take out one of the scenarios and then that's it. Okay. I'll also wrap the... Um, I will wrap the uh, groups right now a little bit earlier, like two, they'll have four ish minutes. Okay. I've never used Jamboard before. Oh yeah, did you enjoy it? New experience. Honestly, I think I totally screwed it up. <laughs> our group, our breakout, whatever breakout room I was put in, like there was no conversation. Nobody turned on mics or cameras. I didn't like, I think oh, nobody, weird. people didn't really know what to do. And then Jamboard, the link took me to slide one. So I put a thought on slide one, but obviously I wasn't part of group one. So I would just, I think I screwed it up. <laughs> That's okay. So everybody it's... else was familiar. Yeah, people, nobody messaged me or seemed to have a hard time. So That's good. It was like, and all of the Jamboards had content on them. Yeah, which is great. Mm -hmm. It is really nice too, because um, it's easy for, for managing the groups. So yeah. I don't have to be able to see um, or go into all of them. Yeah. Cause I can just see like, okay, group three doesn't have anything on there. I'm going to check out them because all the other groups, yeah. you know, are doing okay. Yeah. I wonder if it's helpful the next time we do this, if um, you or the facilitator or me pop between groups, like we can leave and go back, enter and then leave um breakouts right i believe so i know as a host you can i'm not sure if you can as a co-host oh well as a okay but even as a host if you could like pop in and out and just say mm -hmm. chatting because everybody our, like our room was literally silent like i don't yeah weird yeah okay well i will what room is megan in Megan's in room five. I'll pop into room four and see how it's going there. This one I think is probably a little more clear because you have to talk about stuff, right? Oh, you're gone. Okay.
How's it going? Breakout room four is having a good chat. Good. Now the breakout rooms are we have like six minutes left here, right? Yeah. And we're going to go through evaluation and everything else. It's going to be tight. And questions. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going back on mute. Okay. Hi, Megan. So we have, we have six, seven minutes left. Yes. So we're just, we're just going to go for it. Yes. So, uh, we, we already took out scenario three anyways. Yeah. So we'll just, um, no more scenarios. Yes. Okay. Is everybody back? Yep. All right, I'm sure everybody had very valuable conversations and just in the context of time, we're going to uh, wrap up that scenario and move on to our last few pieces here. Uh, uh, fostering fun is very important for girls. When surveys, they noted that positive team and group dynamics, getting to put in effort and trying hard uh, were the biggest indicators of a fun experience. So reflect in your day-to-day -day about what this looks like in your groups and, and communities. Positive team dynamics are not only a want for girls, but a need. We need to be building those dynamics in addition to the reasons on the slide. They enhance girls' performance, address social pressures that lead girls to drop out and prepare coaches to recognize and disrupt the signs uh, when we're seeing girls disengage from sport. There are a lot of ways that we can work on those social connections and adding that time to be able to connect one-on-one -on -one and in a group are, are so important and they will be the, the difference for keeping girls in your programming. To be very effective, all of these values can be part of your organizational attitude, prioritizing those relationships over outcomes. Next, trying hard. Like most people, girls find satisfaction in giving their best effort. Uh, referring back to those intrinsic motivators, girls are uh, have the highest expectations of themselves and it is so important for them to be able to kind of bring their A-game every time. When we get in the way of allowing them to try that new skill or activity, uh, we really jeopardize their experience as well as their social standings. So we want to be equipping them with the fundamentals so they can build on those skills and into more complex skills, uh, encouraging them while they're doing it, the goal setting and reframing uh, as they're going along their progress. That leads us into uh, positive coaching. And, and that's a big piece of what I'm asking in these last couple of slides. So positive coaching is not criticism and competition avoidance. Coaches show they care about their participants by listening to them and coaching with patience and encouragement. If we think about our most positive experiences with sport leaders and recreation leaders, um, it's absolutely those people who took the time to encourage us and, and really one-on-one -on -one be there for us when we needed them. We are going to quickly highlight uh, injury prevention. We noted it was one of the key factors that uh, was something that affected girls' participation. There are three different kinds of injuries. Um, there are the mechanical injuries, the accidents, that would be the physical body that were um, the, the most common definition of injury that you're used to. Um, energetic injury, which is perhaps when you're overdoing that activity um, and then you're getting that repetition and endurance injury. And then there's psychosocial injuries um, where it's affecting them emotionally, that bullying, um, it's a result of the participant not being accepted or welcomed or given equal opportunity. So, 
we can, we do have a, a toolbox of preventative measures. Um, there are, there is a safe sport E module that you can take a look at and go through to enhance your, your skills in that area. Um, like I mentioned quickly before, there's the fundamental movements that need to be introduced so that when the more complex skills are uh, introduced that we're not, we're able to prevent some of that mechanical injury from happening. Um, looking at the risks of that energetic injury and engaging your stakeholders so that you're getting advice on how to prevent those endurance and repetition injuries. And then always keeping an eye on what's happening for social isolation and developing really positive team dynamics. We will wrap up now with a little bit of reflection. So when you think about all the stuff we just went through, which I know is a lot, can you identify in all of the barriers we talked about what you can change today in your everyday work and life? Um, what do you have the, the power to control and change? Then can you recognize that society has a role and the way we unconsciously perpetuate some of these barriers? We can look at advocating for equity in our programs as well as take those steps that we brainstorm to keep girls in sport very intentionally. This work won't just happen by itself. It has to be right at the forefront of our minds. So I'm going to pop it over to Vanessa to take an a overview of the CWS WISE Fund as well as some CPRA information. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Megan. Thank you, everybody, for joining and participating today. I realize that we're right in the final minute right now, so I'll try and be brief. I just put the post-workshop evaluation in the chat and would really appreciate if you filled that out. Um, we are diligent at looking at the feedback and implementing uh, whatever you've experienced to make you know, all of our offerings better in order for girls and young women to really be able to benefit from the opportunities that we get to speak to program leaders such as yourselves. So if you could please take the time to do that, that would be phenomenal. Um, on the slide right now, you'll see that both Canadian Women in Sport and CPRA have <clears throat> funding available. So our WISE Fund is a micro grant of $2,500. The application window closes, <clears throat> excuse me, Monday, November 9th. So it's right around the corner. Um, these funds can be used towards advancing gender equity in sport, physical activity, recreation. Um, and it just needs to be, you know, very clearly outlined how these funds will, will improve that. Are you giving more girls access to play? Are you enabling um, women in the community to get training in order to lead programs? Um, it's really very open-ended and you can always reach out to me if you have any questions about the application process. Uh, similarly, CPRA has their Gender Equity and Recreation Sport Community Grant Initiative. Um, grants are available for up to $15,000 to address the barriers to participation and that application process is open until December 11th. Um, so this link and our wise fund link will be available in a follow up email that I will send out which includes all the resources that were mentioned throughout this workshop. All right, um, you already have the feedback survey in the chat. And this is the last opportunity I'm going to take to thank you. Um, this was a really active group of participants. We appreciated hearing about your experience and um, watching you engage with the content. Megan, thank you so much for sharing um, your experience and providing that Manitoba perspective. Um, I, I know I personally learned a lot. And once again, CPRA and Sport Canada, this, um, it's been great to be able to develop this content alongside you and now have the opportunity to share it. So thank you.